will be when you get to talk in the question and answer session. But before that, you'll have to listen to me for a bit while I read just a few passages from my latest book, The God Delusion, to set the scene for the questions. I'm going to begin with the opening of the book from chapter one, a deeply religious non-believer. The boy lay prone in the grass, his chin resting on his hands. He suddenly found himself overwhelmed by a heightened awareness of the tangled stems and roots, a forest in microcosm, a transfigured world of ants and beetles, and even, though he wouldn't have known the details at the time, of soil bacteria by the billions, silently and invisibly shoring up the economy of the micro-world. Suddenly, the microforest of the turf seemed to swell and become one with the universe and with the rapt mind of the boy contemplating it. He interpreted the experience in religious terms and it led him eventually to the priesthood. He was ordained an Anglican priest and became a chaplain at my school, a teacher of whom I was fond. In another time and place, that boy could have been me under the stars, dazzled by Orion, Cassiopeia and Ursa Major, tearful with the unheard music of the Milky Way, heady with the night scents of frangipani and trumpet flowers in an African garden. Why the same emotion should have led my chaplain in one direction and me in the other is not an easy question to answer. A quasi-mystical response to nature and the universe is common among scientists and rationalists. It has no connection with supernatural belief. I often hear myself described as a deeply religious man. An American student wrote to me that she had asked her professor whether he had a view about me. Sure, he replied, his positive science is incompatible with religion. But he waxes, he waxes ecstatic about nature and the universe. To me, that is religion. But is religion the right word? I don't think so. Much unfortunate confusion is caused by failure to distinguish what can be called Einsteinian religion from supernatural religion. Einstein sometimes invoked the name of God, and he is not the only atheistic scientist to do so inviting misunderstanding by supernaturalists eager to misunderstand and claim so illustrious a thinker as their own. The dramatic, or was it mischievous, ending of Stephen Hawking's A Brief History of Time, for then we should know the mind of God, is notoriously misconstrued. It has led people to believe, mistakenly of course, that Hawking is a religious man. Great scientists of our time who sound religious usually turn out not to be so when you examine their beliefs more deeply. This is certainly true of Einstein and Hawking. One of Einstein's most eagerly quoted remarks is, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. But Einstein also said, it was, of course, a lie what you read about my religious convictions, a lie which is being systematically repeated. I do not believe in a personal God, and I have never denied this, but have expressed it clearly. If something is in me which can be called religious, then it is the unbounded admiration for the structure of the world, so far as our science can reveal it. Does it seem that Einstein contradicted himself? that his words can be cherry-picked for quotes to support both sides of an argument? No. By religion, Einstein meant something entirely different from what is conventionally meant. As I continue to clarify the distinction between supernatural religion on the one hand and Einsteinian religion on the other, bear in mind that I am calling only supernatural gods delusional. That's the end of the extract from chapter one. Now an extract from chapter two, the God hypothesis. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, 
a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Those of us schooled from infancy in his ways can become desensitized to their horror. A naive, blessed with a perspective of innocence, has a clearer perception. Winston Churchill's son, Randolph, somehow contrived to remain ignorant of scripture until Evelyn Waugh and a brother officer, in a vain attempt to keep Churchill quiet when they were posted together during the war, bet him he couldn't read the entire Bible in a fortnight. Unhappily, it has not had the result we hoped. He has never read any of it before and is hideously excited, keeps reading quotations aloud. I say, I bet you didn't know this came in the Bible. <laughs> or merely slapping his side and chortling, God, isn't God a shit? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, better read, was of a similar opinion. The Christian God is a being of terrific character, cruel, vindictive, capricious, and unjust. It is unfair to attack such an easy target. The God hypothesis should not stand or fall with its most unlovely instantiation, Yahweh, nor his insipidly opposite Christian face, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. To be fair, this milksop persona owes more to his Victorian followers than to Jesus himself. Could anything be more mawkishly nauseating than Mrs. C.F. Alexander's Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he? I am not attacking the particular qualities of Yahweh or Jesus or Allah or any other specific god such as Baal, Zeus or Wotan. Instead, I shall define the god hypothesis more defensively. There exists a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. This book will advocate an alternative view. Any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything comes into existence only as the end product of an extended process of gradual evolution. Creative intelligences being evolved necessarily arrive late in the universe and therefore cannot be responsible for designing it. God, in the sense defined, is a delusion and, as later chapters will show, a pernicious delusion. Not surprisingly, since it is founded on local traditions of private revelation rather than evidence, the God hypothesis comes in many versions. Historians of religion recognize a progression from primitive tribal animisms through polytheisms such as those of the Greeks, Romans and Norsemen to monotheisms such as Judaism and its derivatives, Christianity and Islam. Christianity claims to be a monotheistic religion. But you have to wonder sometimes. Rivers of medieval ink, not to mention blood, have been squandered over the mystery of the Trinity and in suppressing deviations such as the Arian heresy. Arius of Alexandria in, Alexandria in the 4th century AD denied that Jesus was consubstantial, i.e. of the same substance or essence, with God. What on earth could this possibly mean, you're probably asking? Substance? What substance? What exactly do you mean by essence? Very little seems the only reasonable reply. Yet the controversy split Christendom down the middle for a century and the Emperor Constantine ordered that all copies of Arius' book should be burned. Splitting Christendom by splitting hairs, such has ever been the way of theology. Do we have one God in three parts or three gods in one? The Catholic Encyclopedia clears up the matter for us in a masterpiece of theological close reasoning. In the unity of the Godhead there are three persons, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, these three persons being truly distinct one from another. Thus, in the words of the Athanasian Creed, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. <laughs> As if that were not clear enough, the encyclopedia quotes the third century theologian, St. Gregory the Miracle Worker. 
There is therefore nothing created, nothing subject to another in the Trinity, nor is there anything that has been added as though it once had not existed, but had entered afterwards. Therefore the Son has never been without the Father, nor the Son without the Spirit, and this same Trinity is immutable and unalterable forever. Whatever miracles may have earned St. Gregory his nickname, they were not miracles of honest lucidity. His words convey the characteristically obscurantist flavour of theology, which, unlike science or most other branches of human scholarship, has not moved on in 18 centuries. Thomas Jefferson, as so often, got it right when he said, ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions. Ideas must be distinct before reason can act upon them, and no man ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. It is the mere abracadabra of the mountebanks calling themselves the priests of Jesus. Jefferson heaped ridicule on the doctrine that, as he put it, there are three gods in his critique of Calvinism. But it is especially the Roman Catholic branch of Christianity that pushes its recurrent flirtation with polytheism towards runaway inflation. The Trinity is, are, joined by Mary, Queen of Heaven, a goddess in all but name, who surely runs God himself a close second as a target of prayers. The Pantheon is further swollen by an army of saints, whose intercessory power makes them, if not demigods, well worth approaching on their own specialist subjects. The Catholic Community Forum helpfully lists 5,120 saints, together with their areas of expertise, which include abdominal pains, abuse victims, anorexia, arms dealers, blacksmiths, broken bones, bomb technicians, and bowel disorders, to venture no further than the bees. Pope John Paul II created more saints than all his predecessors of the past several centuries put together, and he had a special affinity with the Virgin Mary. His polytheistic hankerings were dramatically demonstrated in 1981 when he suffered an assassination attempt in Rome and attributed his survival to intervention by Our Lady of Fatima. A maternal hand guided the bullet. One cannot help wondering why she didn't guide it to miss him altogether. <laughs> <coughs> Others might think the team of surgeons who operated on him for six hours deserved at least a share of the credit. <laughs> but perhaps their hands too were maternally guided. The relevant point is that it wasn't just Our Lady who, in the Pope's opinion, guided the bullet, but specifically Our Lady of Fatima. Presumably Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadeloupe, Our Lady of Medjugorje, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Zaitun, Our Lady of Garabandal, and Our Lady of Nock were busy on other errands at the time. <laughs> well, chapter three debunks the arguments for the existence of God. Leaving that on one side, chapter four why there almost certainly is no God is hard to compress into a brief reading and I'll have to leave that as well. Chapter 5 is about the interesting question of why people are religious because actually most people are. Chapter 6 and why are most people moral to the extent that people are. Chapter 7 the good book and the changing moral zeitgeist. I shall read a little bit from that. I'm keeping a tally of the people walking out. I think it's about three or four so far. <laughs> there are two ways in which scripture might be a source of morals or rules for living. One is by direct instruction, for example, through the Ten Commandments, which are the subject of such bitter contention in the culture wars of America's boondocks. The other is by example. God, or some other biblical character, might serve as, to use the contemporary jargon, a role model. Both scriptural roots, if followed through religiously, encourage a system of morals which any civilized modern person, whether religious or not, would find, I can put it no more gently, obnoxious. Abraham was the founding father of all three great monotheistic religions. 
His patriarchal status renders him only somewhat less likely than God to be taken as a role model. But what modern moralist would wish to follow him? God ordered Abraham to make a burnt offering of his longed-for son. Abraham built an altar, put firewood upon it, and trussed Isaac up on top of the wood. His murdering knife was already in his hand when an angel dramatically intervened with the news of a last-minute change of plan. God was only joking after all. <laughs> Tempting Abraham and testing his faith. A modern moralist cannot help but wonder how a child could ever recover from such psychological trauma. <laughs> By the standards of modern morality, this disgraceful story is an example simultaneously of child abuse, bullying in two asymmetrical power relationships, and the first recorded use of the Nuremberg defense, I was only obeying orders. <laughs> Yet the legend is one of the great foundational myths of all three monotheistic religions. Modern theologians will protest that the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac should not be taken as literal fact. And the appropriate response is twofold. First, many, many people, even to this day, do take the whole of their scripture to be literal fact. And they have a great deal of political power over the rest of us, especially in the United States and in the Islamic world. Second, if not as literal fact, how should we take the story? As an allegory? Then an allegory for what? Surely nothing praiseworthy. As a moral lesson? But what kind of morals could one derive from this appalling story? Remember, all I'm trying to establish for the moment is that we do not, as a matter of fact, derive our morals from scripture. Or if we do, we pick and choose among the scriptures for the nice bits and reject the nasty. But then we must have some independent criterion for deciding which are the moral bits, a criterion which, wherever it comes from, cannot come from scripture itself, and is presumably available to all of us, whether we are religious or not. Apologists even seek to salvage some decency for the God character in this deplorable tale. Wasn't it good of God to spare Isaac's life at the last minute? In the unlikely event that any of my readers are persuaded by this obscene piece of special pleading, I refer them to another story of human sacrifice which ended more unhappily. In Judges chapter 11, the military leader Jephthah made a bargain with God that if God would guarantee Jephthah's victory over the Ammonites, Jephthah would, without fail, sacrifice as a burnt offering whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return. Jephthah did indeed defeat the Ammonites, with a very great slaughter, as is par for the course in the book of Judges, and he returned home victorious. Not surprisingly, his daughter, his only child, came out of the house to greet him with timbrels and dances. And alas, she was the first living thing to do so. Understandably, Jephthah rent his clothes, but there was nothing he could do about it. God was obviously looking forward to the promised burnt offering, and in the circumstances, the daughter very decently agreed to be sacrificed. She asked only that she should be allowed to go into the mountains for two months to bewail her virginity. At the end of this time, she meekly returned and Jephthah cooked her. God did not see fit to intervene on this occasion. God's monumental rage whenever his chosen people flirted with a rival God resembles nothing so much as sexual jealousy of the worst kind and again, it should strike a modern moralist as far from good role model material. The temptation to sexual infidelity is readily understandable, even to those who do not succumb, and it's a staple of fiction and drama from Shakespeare to bedroom farce. But the apparently irresistible temptation to whore with foreign gods is something we moderns find harder to empathize with. To my naive eyes, thou shalt have no other gods but me, would seem an easy enough commandment to keep. A doddle, one might think, compared with thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, or her ass, <laughs> or her ox. <laughs> Yet, throughout the Old Testament, with the same predictable regularity as in bedroom farce, God had only to turn his back for a moment and the children of Israel would be off and at it with Baal or some trollop of a graven image. <laughs> or on, some, on one calamitous occasion, 
a golden calf. There then follows a section on Moses, which I'm going to cut, go on to the end of the Moses section. The ethnic cleansing begun in the time of Moses is brought to bloody fruition in the book of Joshua, a text remarkable for the bloodthirsty massacres it records and the xenophobic relish with which it does so. As the charming old song exultantly has it, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho and the walls came a-tumbling down. There's none like good old Joshua at the battle of Jericho. Good old Joshua didn't rest until they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, and ox and sheep and ass with the edge of the sword. Joshua 6, 21. Yet again, theologians will protest it didn't happen. Well, no. The story has it that the walls came tumbling down at the mere sound of men shouting and blowing horns. So indeed it didn't happen. But that is not the point. The point is that whether true or not, the Bible is held up to us as the source of our morality. And the Bible story of Joshua's destruction of the Laban's realm of Jericho and the invasion of the Promised Land in general is morally indistinguishable from Hitler's invasion of Poland or Saddam Hussein's massacres of the Kurds and the Marsh Arabs. The Bible may be an arresting and poetic work of fiction, but it is not the sort of book you should give your children to form their morals. As it happens, the story of Joshua in Jericho is the subject of an interesting experiment in child morality by the Israeli psychologist George Tamarin. Tamarin presented to more than a thousand Israeli schoolchildren aged between 8 and 14 the book of Joshua's account of the Battle of Jericho. He then asked the children a simple moral question. Do you think Joshua and the Israelites acted rightly or not? They had to choose between A, total approval, B, partial approval, and C, total disapproval. The results were polarized. 66% gave total approval and 26% total disapproval with rather fewer 8% in the middle with partial approval. Here are three typical answers from the total approval A group. In my opinion, Joshua and the sons of Israel acted well. And here are the reasons. God promised them this land and gave them permission to conquer. If they would not have acted in this manner or killed anyone, then there would be the danger that the sons of Israel would have assimilated among the Goyim. In my opinion, Joshua was right when he did it, one reason being that God commanded him to exterminate the people so that the tribes of Israel will not be able to assimilate amongst them and learn their bad ways. Joshua did good because the people who inhabited the land were of a different religion. And when Joshua killed them, he wiped their religion from the earth. The justification for the genocidal massacre by Joshua is religious in every case. Even those in category C who gave total disapproval did so in some cases for backhanded religious reasons. One girl, for example, disapproved of Joshua's conquering Jericho because in order to do so, he had to enter it. I think it is bad since the Arabs are impure and if one enters an impure land, one will also become impure and share their curse. Tamarin ran a fascinating control group in his experiment. A different group of 168 Israeli children were given the same text from the book of Joshua, but with Joshua's own name replaced by General Lin and Israel replaced by a Chinese kingdom 3,000 years ago. Now the experiment gave opposite results. Only 7% approved of General Lin's behavior and 75% disapproved. In other words, when their loyalty to Judaism was removed from the calculation, the majority of the children agreed with the moral judgments that most modern humans would share. Joshua's action was a deed of barbaric genocide. But it all looks different from a religious point of view. And the difference starts early in life. It was religion that made the difference between the children condemning genocide and condoning it. Do those people who hold up the Bible as an inspiration to moral rectitude have the slightest notion of what is actually written in it? 
The following offences merit the death penalty, according to Leviticus 20. Cursing your parents, committing adultery, making love to your stepmother or your daughter-in-law, homosexuality, marrying a woman and her daughter, bestiality, and to add injury to insult, the unfortunate beast is to be killed too. <laughs> you also get executed, of course, for working on the Sabbath. The point is made again and again throughout the Old Testament. In Numbers 15, the children of Israel found a man in the wilderness gathering sticks on the forbidden day. They arrested him and then asked God what to do with him. As it turned out, God was in no mood for half measures that day. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones, and he died. Did this harmless gatherer of firewood have a wife and children to grieve for him? Did he whimper with fear as the first stones flew and scream with pain as the fusillade crashed into his head? What shocks me today about such stories is not that they really happened, they probably didn't. What makes my jaw drop is that people today should base their lives on such an appalling role model as Yahweh, and even worse, that they should bossily try to force the same evil monster, whether fact or fiction, on the rest of us. I'm going to skip the remaining chapters now to the last chapter, uh, and the very last section of the last chapter, the mother of all burkas. One of the unhappiest spectacles to be seen on our streets today is the image of a woman swathed in shapeless black from head to toe, peering out at the world through a tiny slit. I should say that the streets that I normally walk are the streets of England. It probably isn't the case here. The burqa is not just an instrument of oppression of women and claustral repression of their liberty and their beauty, not just a token of egregious male cruelty and tragically cowed female submission. I want to use the narrow slit in the veil as a symbol of something else. Our eyes see the world through a narrow slit in the electromagnetic spectrum. Visible light is a chink of brightness in the vast dark spectrum from radio waves at the long end to gamma rays at the short end. Quite how narrow is hard to appreciate and a challenge to convey. Imagine a giant black burqa with a vision slit of approximately the standard width, say about one inch. If the length of black cloth above the slit represents the shortwave end of the invisible spectrum, and if the length of black cloth below the slit represents the longwave portion of the invisible spectrum, how long would the burqa have to be in order to accommodate a one-inch slit to the same scale? It's hard to represent it sensibly without invoking logarithmic scales, so huge are the lengths we're dealing with. The last chapter of a book like this is no place to start tossing logarithms around, but you can take it from me that it would be the mother of all burkas. <laughs> the one-inch window of visible light is derisorily tiny compared with the miles and miles of black cloth representing the invisible part of the spectrum, from radio waves at the hem of the skirt to gamma rays at the top of the head. What science does for us is to widen the window. It opens up so wide that the imprisoning black garment drops away almost completely, exposing our senses to airy and exhilarating freedom. Optical telescopes use glass lenses and mirrors to scan the heavens, and what they see is stars that happen to be radiating in the narrow band of wavelengths that we call visible light. But other telescopes see in the X-ray or radio wavelengths and present to us a cornucopia of alternative night skies. On a smaller scale, cameras with appropriate filters can see in the ultraviolet and take photographs of flowers that show an alien range of stripes and spots that are visible to and seemingly designed for insect eyes, but which our unaided eyes can't see at all. Insect eyes have a spectral window of similar width to ours, but slightly shifted up the burqa, they are blind to red, and they see further into the ultraviolet than we do, into the ultraviolet garden. The metaphor 
of the narrow window of light broadening out into a spectacularly wide spectrum serves us in other areas of science. We live near the center of a cavernous museum of magnitudes, viewing the world with sense organs and nervous systems that are equipped to perceive and understand only a small middle range of sizes moving at a middle range of speeds. We are at home with objects ranging in size from a few kilometers, the view from a mountain top, to about a tenth of a millimeter, the point of a pin. Outside this range, even our imagination is handicapped, which fortunately we can, and we need, sorry, outside this range, even our imagination is handicapped, and we need the help of instruments and of mathematics, which fortunately we can learn to deploy. The range of sizes, distances, or speeds with which our imaginations are comfortable is a tiny band set in the midst of a gigantic range of the possible, from the scale of quantum strangeness at the smaller end to the scale of Einsteinian cosmology at the larger. Our imaginations are forlornly under-equipped to cope with distances outside the narrow middle range of the ancestrally familiar. We try to visualize an electron as a tiny ball in orbit around a larger cluster of balls representing protons and neutrons. That isn't what it is like at all. Electrons are not like little balls. They are not like anything we recognize. It isn't clear that like even means anything when we try to fly too close to reality's further horizons. Our imaginations are not yet tooled up to penetrate the neighborhood of the quantum. Nothing at that scale behaves in the way matter, as we are evolved to think, ought to behave. Nor can we cope with the behavior of objects that move at some appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Common sense lets us down, because common sense evolved in a world where nothing moves very fast and nothing is very small or very large. The mundane world of the familiar, which I have dubbed middle world. At the end of a famous essay on possible worlds, the great biologist J.B.S. Haldane wrote, Now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of or can be dreamed of in any philosophy. How should we interpret Haldane's queerer than we can suppose? Queerer than can, in principle, be supposed, or just queerer than we can suppose, given the limitation of our brain's evolutionary apprenticeship in middle world? Could we, by training and practice, emancipate ourselves from middle world, tear off our black burqa, and achieve some sort of intuitive, as well as just mathematical, understanding of the very small, the very large, and the very fast? I genuinely don't know the answer. But I'm thrilled to be alive at a time when humanity is pushing against the limits of understanding. Even better, we may eventually discover that there are no limits. Thank you very much. Professor, Professor Dawkins will take questions. Uh, we'll ask you to line up at the two microphones, introduce yourself, and concisely ask your question. Is it possible to have the house lights up a bit so I can see um, people are asking questions? Hello. Is this microphone on? I'm uh, Dr. Howell. It's good to have heard your talk. I really appreciated hearing this. I should like to hear more of you uh, because the more you talk, the more you convince me that there is a God and you crystallize our need for him. I'm glad I have some effect. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, as a scientist, I'm a bit disturbed that you would go on a tirade for 40 minutes against God. So could you and talk a bit more clearly? I can't quite sure, hear. Sure. As a scientist, I'm a bit upset by the fact that you would go on a 40-minute tirade against God and then begin talking of science as if to put the authority of science into what you said. But I do have a question about your long discussion about morality and it coming from the Bible. And that you, you accuse 
people, I suppose Christians, of saying that we get our morality from the scriptures. Um, but clearly this cannot be the case because humanity from every civilization throughout time has a sense of morality and clearly most of them have, had not, have not had access to the Bible. So I'm curious then um, what you think is the origin of this morality. If someone comes in here with a gun and begins shooting all of us, we would call that bad. Why? Why well, is that bad? Um, I think we probably agree that people don't, as a matter of fact, get their morality from scriptures. And that's what I was actually saying. People get their morality from somewhere quite other than the, than the scriptures. Uh, and to the extent that they do get their morality from the scriptures, as I was saying, they pick and choose. Now, if you're asking me where we get our morality from, I think that's an extremely complicated question, and one that I'm very interested in. I've got a whole chapter on it in the book, which I didn't have time to read from. I think that a sort of bedrock of it probably comes from our Darwinian heritage as a kind of misfiring byproduct of our Darwinian past when we lived in small villages or small roving bands, which meant that we were surrounded by close kin, and that, as you no doubt know, uh, is one good prerequisite for the evolution of altruism under Darwinian rules. And also, in those small villages or roving bands, we would have been surrounded by people whom we are likely to meet again and again throughout our life, which provides the basis for the other main Darwinian reason to be moral or altruistic. That, I think, is the Darwinian origin. And I suspect that, although we no longer live in small bands, the same rule of thumb, rules of thumb, which were honed in our Darwinian past, are playing themselves out under the alien conditions of modern urban society. The rule of thumb used to be, be nice to everyone you meet, because everyone you meet is likely to be either a cousin and or somebody you're going to meet again and again, and therefore in a position to reciprocate. Darwinism doesn't forecast, doesn't suggest that we should be all wise and do what is actually going to be best for our selfish genes. Instead, it says that it builds into our brains rules of thumb which worked in our ancestral past. That rule of thumb, be nice to everybody, is still in our brains. It is a lust which is rather similar to the sexual lust, which is still in our brains even though we may use contraception and therefore are not actually using copulation to reproduce. The same rule of thumb persists, and that is also true of the lust to be good, the lust to be nice. That, I think, is the Darwinian origin. But I think that it's become modified and refined through culture, through civilization, until it shows itself in the much more sophisticated and actually much more pleasant uh, rules for being nice that we see today. Wherever else it comes from, it certainly doesn't come from scripture, and that was the only point I was trying to make from that particular reading. Yeah. Well, hello there. Oh, well, welcome to welcome to America. Uh, I, I'm, I've been reading your book. I, I've been reading your book, and I, I think you're a terrific writer. And I got to say, listening to you in person and that accent and everything, man, I just think you're brilliant. <laughs> but um, I, I thought there'd be a but, yes. I, I know. I, uh, well, it, it's it's Lynchburg. Um, <laughs> well, I, I am I am a theist. Uh, you'll be disappointed to know, but uh, my, you know how. Um, Bertrand Russell, you know, said that uh, if he faced God, he'd ask, you know, where, you know, he didn't give enough evidence. Where was the evidence on it? Uh, a couple pieces of evidence that I would just kind of be interested to hear, hear what you think about. Um, pertaining to this uh, issue of ethics, I read this chapter on, on ethics in your uh, book. I found it interesting. Um, I mean, you were dealing with the, the origin of our moral sense, more so than, I think, the origin of morality itself. You, you'd probably agree, right? Um, so, so, you know, you, you still wonder, what is it about the world that makes some things, you know, uh, right and, and some things wrong? Some things good, some things bad, and, and you know, you, you want to retain the language of, of some things are evil, and, and you give a lot of religious examples, and I'm, I'm in agreement with you on some of that, you know. Uh, but if we're going to retain these categories, these very strong, you know, m moral categories, 
it, it seems to me that naturalism is going to be very hard pressed to kind of provide an account um, for, for where real good and evil would, would be. I mean, um, I'm not sure how, how entirely we can simply assert the existence of value without providing a, a yeah. deeper account for it. And, and one other, moral freedom as well. Uh, it seems to me that if uh, the naturalist is kind of um, shackled, you know, I mean, it, it, a naturalistic world, it would seem as if we're just bound and determined to behave just the way that we do. Mor if morality is all about ought and ought implies can, how can we ever do anything other than exactly what it is that we do? So I'd, I'd be real interested in your responses to those things. Well, I think it's a problem for all of us. I mean, not, not, not just for naturalists. I, know, I think it is actually fairly baffling where our morality comes from and why we're, we're in fact as nice as we are. I mean, the professionals in this field are moral philosophers, and moral philosophers, the majority of them, are, are not theologically inclined. I mean, they tend to develop ideas, the simplest of all, the one, the one we all know about is the, is the golden rule, be, behave to others as you would wish they should behave to you, and moral philosophers have developed other such principles, um, uh, always oppose suffering, um, always uh, behave as if you didn't know whether you were going to be at the top of the pecking order or the bottom. These are all moral precepts which moral philosophers have developed. Now, it's a genuinely difficult question why any individual should wish to follow such moral precepts. If I ask myself, I, I'm actually a very moral person, I think, and I'm sure most of you are too. Um, if I ask myself why I don't steal, why I pay my taxes, why I do the, all the things that keep society going, I suppose it's a slightly irrational feeling that I wouldn't wish to live in the kind of society where people behaved in the sort of ways that I wouldn't wish them to, be, to behave in, and therefore I shouldn't behave in those ways either. Now that isn't entirely rational because if I behave in an antisocial way, then that doesn't actually stop anybody else doing the nice things to me that, um, well, it, maybe it does, I and mean, that, that could, could be the problem. But it is a genuinely difficult problem why we are moral. All that I wish to assert today is that, um, re is that religion certainly doesn't help. Or if it does, I mean, if there's anybody here who thinks that they're moral purely because they're frightened of what God might do if they're not, I mean, that's a pretty contemptible reason to be moral. And, and I don't think we pr probably have much respect for people who only behave well because of the great surveillance camera in the sky. Um, <laughs> so I think that, that, uh, that I'm sure all, all of us here are, are moral for, for better reasons than, than that, although I quite agree with the questioner, it's genuinely difficult to decide uh, why, why we are. Thank goodness we are. <laughs> Good evening, Professor Dawkins. Uh, my name is Thomas Lukowski. I come from uh, Thomas Jefferson's University, here to ask you a question. Richard, atheists have a PR problem. They are among the most distrusted minorities in the U.S. Many, e many people equate atheism with immorality and pessimism. They ask, what good has atheism done? Atheism is so cold, I don't find any comfort from those who do not believe in God. Some have attempted to answer these criticisms with new life stances, such as humanism or the church of reality. They assert there will, be, there will not be widespread apostasy until there is a replacement for religion. Sam Harris says, we must find ways of meeting our emotional needs that do not require the abject embrace of the, of the preposterous. Further, he says, we must learn to invoke the power of ritual and to mark those transitions in every human life that demand profundity, birth, marriage, death, without lying to ourselves about the nature of reality. So my question is, do you, what is your view of that assertion that there will not be widespread apostasy until we find a replacement for religion? Yes, thank you. That's an extremely interesting question. Um, a very important one. If it is the case that people find consolation and comfort in religion, then I'm not in the least surprised, but note 
that that doesn't in any way imply that religious beliefs are true. What is comforting and what is true are two entirely different things. It's important to get that out of the way first, because there are people, I'm sorry to say, who can't tell the difference between that which is comforting and that which is true. Um, if you don't see the point, uh, imagine a doctor telling you you're absolutely fine when actually you've got terminal cancer. There are people who would wish their doctor to lie to them, um, but um, th those people who would not wish their doctor to lie to them should not be sympathetic to the idea that, um, that, re that religion has value simply because it is comforting or consoling. Now, the questioner quotes Sam Harris, as, by the way, I strongly recommend his books, um, The End of Faith and Letter to a Christian Nation, both utterly brilliant books. Sam Harris um, says we need to replace the um, various roles of religion. Uh, comfort might be one of them, ritual might be another, uh, rites of passage, uh, marriages, funerals and so on might be another. To the extent that humans do need ritual and do need uh, public meetings to signal things like births, marriages, and deaths. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't put on secular equivalents of the religious ceremonies that mostly dominate our, our um, lives at the moment. Uh, I have myself organized one secular funeral for a very dearly loved colleague and been to many others. Uh, and um, what, what we did and what is normally done is to obviously dispense with all prayers, but you retain music, you retain poetry, you can have um, readings from the deceased person's favorite books, eulogies by people who knew and loved the deceased person. This is not difficult to arrange. It has the smack of sincerity about it in a way that Prayers, which are for all the same prayers for everybody, regardless of who they are. Um, the smack of sincerity comes from the fact that they're individually tailored to the individual who's died. Whenever I've been to religious funerals which have an element of the non-religious about them, religious funerals which include eulogies, which include the deceased's favorite poetry, etc., I don't know about you, but my experience is that the prayers fall absolutely flat whereas the eulogies and the poems are intensely moving. My wife even says, thank goodness for the prayers. They're the one thing that stops her from crying and, and keeps her um, <laughs> amused almost, rather than, rather than being sad about the, the loss of the much-loved dead person. The questioner is absolutely right in his preamble when he says that at least in American society, atheists are... Um, the least loved, least um, respected major group. That's something that's got to change because atheists are far, far more numerous than most people realize. And that's mostly because they won't come out of the closet. <laughs> it's obvious that in an intelligent, educated audience such as this university, I stress this university since... <laughs> who, was it saw, who was it saw fit to give them accreditation, I'd like to know. In a place like this, I have not the slightest doubt that there are a very large number of atheists and agnostics. What is wrong with everybody in that position throughout the country, standing up, recognizing each other, joining together and forming, I won't say a lobby, because somebody suggested that organizing atheists is rather like herding cats. <laughs> they are, on the whole, too intelligent and independent-minded to lend themselves to being herded. <laughs> but if a 
if an atheist lobby could be got together which showed a small fraction of its numerical strength, it would outnumber, for example, the Jewish lobby, which is formidably and notoriously powerful in this country. There are more secularists, agnostics and atheists in this country than there are Jews. But do they have a voice in politics? Is it possible for an atheist to get elected to high office in this country? No. The Congress of this country is presumably at least partly derived from the intelligent, educated wing of the country. That being so, it is statistically almost inconceivable that a substantial number of members of Congress are not atheists. Obviously, many of them must be. And yet, not a single one of them will admit it. They are forced to dissemble, even to lie, about their religious convictions, because that's the only way they can get elected. Well, isn't that something that the American electorate ought to be doing something about? So I accept the question as premise and suggest that it's up to, well, I'm not an American citizen, so it's unfortunately not up to me, but <laughs> up to all of you to do something about it and to change the status of atheists in this country and to change the electability of atheists in this country. Good evening. My name is Amy LeMay Hammond. I'm a first year student at RMWC. And. Sorry, I didn't hear that. My name is Amy LeMay Hammond. I'm a first year student at RMWC. Thank you. Yes, okay. And firstly, I'd like to thank you for recognizing that there are probably many atheists in this room and that we are not morally dangerous or have no morals. Um, my question is. In the case of sort of mock religions such as uh, the invisible pink unicorn and such, which I'm sure you're familiar with, do those help the atheist cause or do they actually hurt it by creating sort of um, hilarity about religion? Okay, they do, they do one good thing. They, 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 they answer one question. And it, it's a very important question because it's a very ubiquitous one. It's the following question. You cannot disprove the existence of God. Now, amazingly, there are a lot of people who think that's a powerful argument. You cannot disprove the existence of God, which somehow seems to suggest to them, oh, well, therefore, the existence of God must be about equally likely to the, to the non-existence. Existence and non-existence must be approximately equally likely. And the point about the invisible pink unicorn and the flying spaghetti monster and the celestial teapot and all those e examples is simply to demonstrate that it's just not the case that because you cannot disprove something, therefore that makes it the slightest bit likely. And so that, that, that's, that, that's the sole purpose of them. It is a very important purpose. Thank you. Hi, Mr. Dawkins. Um, my name is Zach Smith. Uh, I happen to be from Liberty University. And uh, I just want to applaud <laughs> your... Uh, your uh, atheist wit because I have never at the same time been uh, so insulted but amused at the same time so uh, I, just, I just want to say that was a good one but um, uh, my uh, I uh, have to forego my uh, original question uh, with the PR uh, state of uh, the atheist, uh, atheist that uh, you've you know implied that there's some kind of social justice uh, issue at, 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 at stake here by saying that it's, you know, wrong or that, that ought to be. And that kind of language kind of implies that there is some kind of moral standard. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you know, from, from your perspective, what kind of moral standard could uh, be a basis for that kind of social justice if, if indeed there's no higher power? Uh, I, I just... Oh, well, um, first, I, I don't understand why you should feel insulted. I, I didn't insult you. I insulted God. And that's a very different... <laughs> Um, but, but then the, the, the question of, of social justice in the, in the, in the, in the rights of, of, of atheists to be considered citizens and to be considered 
electable. I don't think the issue is, is quite that they should be elected because they are atheists. That wasn't the point. The point is that being an atheist should not debar you any more than being black, to go back in history to being black or Jewish or Catholic or a woman or any of the other things which historically have tended to make somebody unelectable and no longer do, I'm delighted to say, um, that, that, that atheists and indeed homosexuals, um, but, which, are, which, are, which are the next one most, most difficult lot to get elected, um, <laughs> but atheists are the, are the, sort of, are, are the, are the last major group um, to be embraced in, in, in this um, um, charmed circle of the electable. Um, I'm not saying they should be elected because they're atheists. I'm, I'm saying that, that, that they should be free to openly say what their religious conviction or lack of conviction is and not thereby instantly be unelectable. That, that's, all I, that, that's all I meant. I didn't mean anything more than that. Thank you. Uh, I just would like to say at the outset, I thank you for, for coming and putting yourself, in a sense, on the firing line. And in so far as you've taken on God, you, you have um, always the opportunity that uh, God might win. So um, I, I would like just to call your attention to something that, in, in my hearing of your, your talk, um, you mentioned in a, in a the sense of ridicule about the Trinity and, and that it's a front to reason, very difficult to understand, even make sense of, and what, you know, why would a person even try for that matter? But you, and interestingly enough, you finished your lecture with quantum strangeness, which in, in fact is the same problem for scientists as the Trinity is for believing Christians who have a need to understand. Just m making that comment. Um, and and I recall, I, I spent most of my life being an atheist or a non-believer in that sense and I've seen the world through that lens and I understand the logic of it and and so on uh, when I became a believer um, I also noticed that uh, the same world out there was being viewed through a different meta metaphysical lens and I would suggest to you that there's a burqa as well for the metaphysical reality you can shift up and look through faith or you can shift down and look through human intelligence or, or human understanding call it reason or intuition or whatever but I would call to your attention that there is a whole new reality that comes it's not uh, supernatural in the sense but it's a shift in understanding yes um, I, I, I think that's a very interesting point and I, I can answer it with reference to how you began which was the comparison between quantum theory which is deeply mysterious and the mystery of the Trinity, and you um, implied that there's a sort of comparability between those, that they are both um, deeply mysterious, so why should one prefer one over the other? The answer to that is actually very simple. Quantum theory yields experimental predictions which have been verified to an accuracy, number of decimal places, so accurate that the great theoretical physicist Richard Feynman compared it to the accuracy of predicting the width of North America to the accuracy of the width of one human hair. That is why quantum theory has to be taken seriously. And it doesn't matter, well it does matter, but it's, um, one can take in one's stride because of the brilliance of the experimental verification. It doesn't matter that quantum theory is so mysterious that as Feynman himself once said, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. <laughs> it is true that the human mind, and I believe the reason is that the human mind evolved in middle world, where the strangeness of quantum theory never impinged upon human life. It is true that the human mind cannot grasp, cannot visualize, cannot imagine the assumptions that quantum theory ne needs to make. But human physicists doing experiments can verify the predictions of quantum theory to a, an accuracy which is utterly stupefying and which leaves one in no doubt that in some sense quantum theory must be right. Nothing remotely like that could ever be claimed for the doctrine of the Trinity, nor, by the way, is the doctrine of the, tr of the Trinity anything like so interestingly mysterious as quantum theory. Hello. 
Thank you for coming to Lynchburg. My name is Matthew Warner. I'm a grad student at Liberty University. And I have <laughs> one, uh, one question. Going back to ethics and morality, you essentially said that the Darwinian <clears throat> uh, reason we have morality is that back in the day, you had cousins and people and you wanted them to reciprocate. In order to act like that, you would have to make decisions. The decisions would have to be based on critical thinking. I was wondering if you have a Darwinian response or explanation for how critical thinking um, relates to Darwinianism. Right, I think I understand you. You're, you're, wait, wait, the question is not really about morality. The, the question is about, is there a similar Darwinian account of critical thinking? Which is at the basis of your explanation for morality, in my mind. Well, and my explanation for everything else, presumably, as well, not, not, not just morality. Um, <laughs> well, um, I mean... Crit critical thinking is, is something which um, isn't universally a, an attribute of the human mind. Um, <laughs> it's, um, uh, I, I don't think it's very, very hard to imagine, that, um, I, Im imagine ways in which critical thinking could have benefited the survival of our ancestors. I mean, I, I think that um, taking a a rational view of evidence would probably have helped our ancestors to survive in a world of saber-toothed tigers and ice ages and drying up water holes and all the other things which, all the other hazards which threatened life. Um, I would have thought rather the reverse, that the, the problem that faces us is how do we explain uncritical lack of thinking? Why is there so, such a lot of that about? Um, and uh, I, I mean, I do have a chapter I explaining that, but I should have thought that was a, that was a rather harder problem than than the one about about uh, critical thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Carl Swenson, and. Um, I'm going to tip my hand right off the start, like the other brave questioners, and say um, <clears throat> that if, if theories and ideas around things like intelligent design and creationism are scientifically all but dead, they just haven't fallen over yet, um, then I see something else waiting in the wings scientifically that needs, that would could be a problem for science. And that's, and so I ask your opinion about this. Um, things like, um, you've used the word mind a lot. We think of mind as some dimensionless thing in the middle of our head which tells us what to do and is separate from the brain, um, which is similar to the soul, another popular notion. So what does science or philosophy at this point have to say about um, this? About the, about the mind, about... Yeah, about the existence of it. That uh, or the soul or the popular notions of it. Well, uh, um, I mean, my, my, my view would be a materialistic one. Not everybody's would. And, and my, my view would be that uh, mind and soul and consciousness and all those sorts of words are... They, they describe something which is a manifestation of the material brain and doesn't have any existence outside material brains, where material brains could at some future date perhaps include silicon brains, not, not just neuronal brains, but there has to be some sort of uh, physical medium, doubtless highly complicated, highly interconnected, a network of, um, of complicated wiring diagram, uh, which um, uh, by, by some means which neurophysiologists are now working on results in the phenomena which psychologists study and which we colloquially give names like mind and even soul too. So I don't think that the mind is an immaterial thing that has any existence outside the material world. Um, I'm Archana Dutta. Um, I'm a sophomore at Randolph Macon Women's College, majoring in biology and environmental science. Um, my, 
My question is in no way controversial. It's not intended to be so. And um, it basically springs out of what uh, the point you made in your hypothesis about God. Um, do you imply that we may evolve to become God, or do we share a common ancestry with God? Well, um, I don't think it's very helpful to suggest that we are likely to evolve to become gods. I do think that um, there may very well be somewhere in the universe be evolved beings which are so far advanced compared to us that we would, if we saw them, we might very well be tempted to call them gods. And it, it is also possible, by the same token, that if our species goes on evolving either genetically and or culturally for a sufficient number of millennia, our descendants might become so advanced that we would be tempted to call them gods. However, uh, I don't think I would wish to call them gods because however advanced they are, however ingenious, however intelligent, however um, their technology would strike us with awe, they would still be evolved beings. They would be beings that had evolved by a process of slow, gradual, incremental evolution. And that, to me, is the diagnostic feature of a god. A god doesn't evolve. A god just happens. A god is just there. And so um, I, I think my answer to your question is, it's an interesting thought, but, in, but, but actually I don't think it would be a helpful use of the word god any more than if a Stone Age hunter were to suddenly be transported into the 21st century uh, and would of course be awestruck by computers and mobile phones and Boeing 747s and helicopters and rockets to the moon, that Stone Age hunter might be tempted to call us gods, but I think it's a temptation that he should resist and so should we. Dr. Dawkins, I uh, am a professor uh, at Liberty University of uh, a non-subject, religion. Right. But uh, according to your book, and I've been reading your book, and it's helped me to understand atheist mind, and I appreciate that. I have a whole group of my students here tonight. They've been in the back there. And because uh, I wanted them to hear what you have to say, and we want to be careful not to set up straw men about atheists, which you know, are done, and, and I want them to avoid Thank you that. very much. Okay. Yes, sir. But I, I wanted to uh, read from your book. You've been reading from your book, and right. I find it uh, interesting, this footnote on page 82. We might be seeing something similar today in the over-publicized tergiversation of the philosopher Anthony Flew, who announced in his old age that he had been converted to belief in some sort of deity. Now, I wanted to read that footnote before my question. Right. You would consider yourself a de facto atheist, leaning toward a strong atheist, category six, leaning toward seven. Uh, apparently because you would say the evidence demands your being an atheist, not a theist. For you, the evidence makes the existence of God highly improbable. So my question is, what evidence would you need to conclude that God's existence at least was as probable as that of extraterrestrials? And why did you relegate um, Anthony Flew to a footnote with, with him being such an eminent philosopher and uh, finding design in the DNA an indication of yes. deity? Um, Anthony Flew is a, a, is a British philosopher who has long been um, a champion of atheism and he has, as the questioner remarks, announced in his old age that he has um, been converted to a form of deism, not out and out theism, a form of deism where he thinks there probably is some kind of mysterious intelligence at the root of the universe. Many great people have thought the same. What disappointed me about Anthony Flew's reasons for that is that he publicly admitted, publicly announced that what had convinced him 
was the idea of intelligent design, and specifically the book of Michael Behe. Well, that doesn't argue for um, the surviving powers that Anthony Flew once had as an intellectual. Um, no serious thinker could possibly be uh, positively impressed by the arguments of the so-called intelligent design creationists. There may be good reasons for believing in a god, and if there are any, I would expect them to come from possibly modern physics, from cosmology, from the um, observation that, uh, as some people claim, the laws and constants of the universe are too finely tuned to, um, to be an accident. That would not be a wholly disreputable reason for believing in a, some form of supernatural deity. I think there's a very good argument against it, and I've developed much of my chapter four to, as I think, refuting that argument. If Anthony Flew had said that, then I think we could have a serious argument with him. But what he actually said was that he was convinced by intelligent design in biology. And anybody who knows anything about biology um, will immediately see that that is ridiculous. Um, I'm sorry to be so I'm sorry to be so harsh, but when I last saw Anthony Flew, he, he didn't endear himself to me because he actually went about promulgating the legend that Darwin himself had a deathbed conversion. And that really is a ridiculous story, which was long, long ago um, disposed of by the Darwin family. And it led me to uh, somewhat discount other things that Anthony Flew is now saying. He once was a, a great philosopher. It's very sad. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Ryan Thomas. I'm a biology major at Liberty University. And uh, I kind of have a two... I kind of have a... <laughs> sorry, I... I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my name is Ryan Thomas. Yes. I'm a biology major at, university, at Liberty University right now. And uh, I have a two-part question for you, if you don't mind. Um, my first question would be, do you draw a distinction in between blind faith and reasonable faith? Okay. Um, is there a distinction? Do I draw a distinction between blind faith and reasonable faith? No. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting that you say that because um, just through, through my, my own studies, through, through my, uh, my investigation in, into this matter, I have come to the conclusion that there's no such thing as proof right. that uh, there is reasonable faith and, and there is blind faith. When I, uh, when I drop a ball uh, you know, to the ground on earth, it's, it's reasonable for me to believe that the ball will fall the very next time that I drop it, but I can't prove it just as I can't prove that you exist. Yes. I believe that you exist based on a reasonable faith because I can see you, because I can hear you. But our senses can sometimes deceive us. People on cocaine feel bugs in their skin, but that doesn't make it real. Uh, people that are taking hallucinogens see things, but it doesn't make it real. Okay. So I think it's interesting that you deny the, the line between reasonable faith... Yes, I mean, I think we agree. I think we're just using words in a different way. Okay. I, th okay. I think it's a, it's a semantic thing. Um, so, something like um, when, you, when you drop a ball, it falls, and when you drop another ball, it falls, and when you drop another ball, it falls. Um, I don't think I would wish to use the word faith for your belief that the next time you drop it, it will fall. I don't think that's what I would use the word faith for. I think that's, that's, that's normal science. I mean, that's based upon... Uh, Newton's laws, it's based upon a tremendous body of theory, it's based upon uh, scientific evidence. So I would not use the word reasonable faith the way you're using it. It seems to be you're using reasonable faith for um, basing beliefs upon, upon evidence. So if, if you're using reasonable faith to mean 
belief based upon evidence, then there's no disagreement. We're just using words in a different way. I define faith as, as belief that's not based upon evidence. Okay. And that's why I answered your first question in the way that I, that I did. I, I don't think we actually disagree, and I'm sure we disagree about other things, but I don't think we disagree about this <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, that, in, 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 in an other than semantic way. Okay. okay. Um, then, then my second question, I'm sorry, I didn't expect you to answer no actually to the first one. But it, <laughs> Yeah, there are surprises every day. Uh, my second question is, uh, considering then that we must believe what's based on reason, and, and reason, of course, is based on experience, correct? You know, r reason is, is based on the fact that when I, the, when I drop the ball, it, it falls every time, so it's reasonable to believe next time I drop the ball, it's going to fall. Why then is it reasonable, considering our experience concerning the law of cause and effect, concerning the fact that we, our experience tells us that everything which has an effect has a cause? How is it that it's more reasonable to believe that the universe created itself? Because when confined to the natural laws, because nature is bound by its own limits, which, which are the natural laws. And if nature is bound by the laws which say that matter can't create itself, then how do you get around this okay. issue? There must have been something outside, outside the system. It is, it is very difficult. <laughs> it is, of course, a very difficult question to ask how things began at the very beginning of the universe. It's very difficult to even know what the word beginning even means with respect to the universe. That any physicist, any biologist, any scientist, any reasonable person would accept. However, when you ask what's the alternative, if the alternative that's being offered to um, what physicists now talk about, a big, a big bang, a spontaneous um, uh, singularity which gave rise to the origin of the universe, if the alternative to that is a divine intelligence, a creator which would have to have been complicated, statistically improbable, the very kind of thing which scientific theories such as Darwin's exists to explain, then immediately we see that however difficult and apparently inadequate the theory of the physicists is, the theory of the theologians that the first cause was a complicated intelligence is even more difficult to accept. They're both difficult but the theory of the cosmic intelligence is even worse. What Darwinism does is to raise our consciousness to the power of science to explain the existence of complex things and intelligences and creative intelligences are above all complex things, they're statistically improbable. Darwinism raises our consciousness to the power of science to explain how such entities, and the human brain is one, how such entities can come into existence from simple beginnings. However difficult those simple beginnings may be to accept, they are a whole lot easier to accept than complicated beginnings. Complicated things come into the universe late as a consequence of slow, gradual, incremental steps. God, if he exists, would have to be a very, very, very complicated thing indeed. So to postulate a God as the beginning of the universe, as the answer to the riddle of the first cause, is to shoot yourself in the conceptual foot because you are immediately postulating something far, far more complicated than that which you are trying to explain. Now physicists cope with this problem in various ways, which may seem to you, they even seem to me, somewhat unconvincing. For example, they suggest that um, our universe is but one bubble in a foam of universes, the multiverse, and each bubble in the foam has a different set of laws and constants. And by the anthropic principle, we have to be, since we're here talking about it, we have to be in the kind of bubble with the kind of laws and constants which are capable of giving rise to the evolutionary process and therefore to creatures like us. That is one current physicist explanation for how we exist in the kind of universe that we, that we do. It doesn't sound so shatteringly convincing as 
say, Darwin's own theory, which is self-evidently very convincing. Nevertheless, however unconvincing that may sound, it is many, many, many orders of magnitude more convincing than any theory that says complex intelligence was there right from the outset. If you, if you have problems seeing how matter could just come into existence, try thinking about how complex intelligent matter or complex intelligent entities of any kind could suddenly spring into existence. It's many, many orders of magnitude harder to understand. Sorry, you've had three already. <laughs> My name is Amber Moore. I'm from Liberty University as well. I have two questions for you. How can you believe in extraterrestrials as a higher being and not believe in a god? Could you just say that again? How can you, <laughs> how can you believe as extra extraterrestrials as a higher being and not believe in a god? How can I believe that an extraterrestrial is a higher being and not believe, how can you believe in them as, a, extra, as an advanced higher being. Yeah, I understand okay. um, the words of your question. Um, <laughs> an extraterrestrial higher being, if one exists, comes into existence as the end product of a long, slow, gradual, incremental process of evolution, just like the one that gave rise to us. That's the explanation for why the extraterrestrial, if it is indeed an advanced being, is an advanced being. It's a very sensible, easy to understand explanation. It's a gradual explanation. You start from simple beginnings and you work up. God isn't like that. God is a being that is not supposed to have evolved. God is a being that has always existed and therefore does not have the benefit of that kind of sensible, rational, gradualistic explanation. That is an absolutely crucial difference. I suspect that on other planets there probably are beings, as I said before, which are so far advanced relative to us that they might as well be gods except for this one absolutely crucial respect, that they came into the universe by slow, gradual degrees. They didn't just happen. Nothing as complicated as that just happens. They didn't just happen and therefore they or it or he or she could not be responsible for designing the universe. Okay, my last question. <laughs> this is probably going to be the most simplest one for you to answer, but what if you're wrong? Well, what if I'm wrong? I mean, anybody could be wrong. We could all be wrong about the flying spaghetti monster and the pink unicorn and the flying teapot. Um, <laughs> You happen to have been brought up, I would presume, in the Christian faith. You know what it's like not to believe in a particular faith because you're not a Muslim, you're not a Hindu. Why aren't you a Hindu? Because you happen to have been brought up in America, not in India. If you'd been brought up in, Indo in India, you'd be a Hindu. If you were brought up in, in um, Denmark in the time of the Vikings, you'd be believing in Wotan and Thor. If you were brought up in, in classical Greece, you'd be believing in, in Zeus. If you were brought up in... Central Africa, you'd be believing in the great juju up the mountain. In, there's no particular reason to pick on the Judeo-Christian God in which by the sheerest accident you happen to have been brought up and, and ask me the question, what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong about the great juju at the bottom of the sea? <laughs> In continuation of the last fellow's questions, uh, <laughs> the problem is that you're applying natural laws to God, whereas he claims to exist outside of them. Therefore, he does not necess necessitate a beginning, unlike matter, on the other hand, which, ne which necessitates a beginning. Well, isn't that just too easy? I mean, you... <laughs> You talk your way out of having to provide a rational argument by just decreeing by fiat that God, <laughs> that, that God simply de declares himself outside matter and therefore doesn't need the same kind of, of argument as, as anything else. I mean, 
If you're convinced by that kind of thing, you're welcome. My name is Kay Goodman, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether or not there is a God or gods. What effect has it upon humankind, upon the orders of the world, upon men and women, that we rather consistently refer to God as a male? Well. I, that's a perfectly fair point, uh, and um, I, um, I mean, to, to me, to me there, there is no difference between a non-existent male and a non-existent <laughs> female. Um, to the extent that, to the extent that God or gods has sociological, psychological political significance, then I could easily imagine that um, if one could somehow begin a cult of a female god, it might well have a, a very improving effect upon human society. I'm nervous. Amber Dawn, student here at Randolph-Macon. Um, thank you for that previous answer. Um, I'll give you a bit of reprieve. I am not challenging you in any way, shape, or form. Um, and I only wrote this down because I know I'd forget what I wanted. As someone coming from a religious family, especially in an area with such a dominant religion and a particular figurehead, how does someone find their own way when leaving is not quite an option? Uh, I didn't quite the last sentence. Does. <laughs> how does one find their own way when leaving just yet is not quite an option? Okay. Um, First, and I have a small... I story. think this is a very serious question because I've had, I've had letters from really quite a lot of people, in, especially in America, and they say things like, I, I'm actually an atheist, but I daren't admit it. Um, I'm frightened of my family, I'm frightened of my parents, um, I'm frightened of my minister. Um, I read an article the other day about a boy in a, t a small town in Texas who didn't want to be confirmed. And the priest said, well, that's okay. You don't have to be confirmed, but you have to write down your reasons for not being confirmed. Why did the boy have to write down his reasons for not being confirmed into that particular church? He didn't have to write down his reasons for not being bar mitzvahed as a Jew. It just so happened that he was born into a Christian family, and therefore the presumption was made that he'd better have a good reason for not being confirmed into the religion of his parents or else. And that's one of the main problems we have, is the assumption that our society makes, regardless of whether we are religious or not, we all buy into the convention that children belong to the religion of their parents. You will see newspaper articles talking about Christian children and Muslim children and Jewish children, children who may be as young as three or four years old and who are therefore obviously much too young to know what their beliefs are about the cosmos and humanity and religion. There is no such thing as a Christian child. There is only a child of Christian parents. Whenever you hear the phrase Christian child, or Muslim child, or Protestant child, or Catholic child, the phrase should grate like fingernails on a blackboard. Just as the feminists have raised our consciousness to phrases like one man, one vote. You can't hear that phrase now without sort of at least wincing slightly because you realize it should be one person, one vote. At present, we haven't had our consciousness raised about the labeling of children with the religion of their parents. That's just one aspect, and it shows itself, to return to the questioner, it shows itself in a great 
deal of difficulty that any young person has, indeed any person of any age has, in departing from the religion of their parents, their social group, their grandparents, their uncles and aunts and so on. It might be a bit like getting divorced. I mean, it's sort of something that raises um, real social problems. There's a magnificent one-woman show by the comic actress Julia Sweeney called Letting Go of God, in which she describes her own journey from Catholic upbringing to the mature and balanced atheist that she is today. <laughs> and she describes the difficulty of admitting to her family that she, that she had become an atheist. It actually was reported in, in, the, in a newspaper and her mother read it and screamed down the telephone. And Julia Sweeney, it's very witty, a very funny performance she, she does. She says um, that her mother was absolutely horrified. Not believing in God was one thing, but an atheist? I don't know what the answer is. The, I mean, the, the, the precedent of, of, of gay people is one that one can vaguely bear in mind. I mean, uh, homosexuality is now much, much more accepted in our society than it was when I was young. Uh, when, I mean, homosexuality was actually illegal in Britain up until, I think, the 1960s, believe it or not. Um, and uh, the great... British mathematician, one of the two fathers of the modern computer, Alan Turing, um, who arguably, because of his brilliance in solving the German Enigma codes in the Second World War, did more to win the Second World War than either Churchill or Eisenhower. Alan Turing was arrested for homosexual behavior in the 1950s and was um, essentially driven to suicide. Uh, that has now changed, and now people can be openly gay. The word gay has become a, a word used with pride rather than with shame. Uh, I think that we do have to have a, a shift in social attitudes to atheism, which will um, mirror that towards homosexuality. Um, <laughs> It is, after all, just a view about the cosmos and about um, various other things, about humanity, about morality. It is really quite extraordinary that somebody's view about such an academic matter as whether there exists a supreme intelligence should reflect upon their, um, the way they're looked at in society, the way their family and their friends look at them. It is quite remarkable that that should be the case. Once again, it's something we've all got to do something about. Um, last question, very simple. Is anger a common symptom of a person who is going through the deconditioning process of their parents' religion? I, I, didn't, I think you're too close to the microphone. I said, is anger a common symptom of a person who is going through the deconditioning process of their parents' religion? Um, is anger a common symptom of a person who is going through the a deconditioning process from their parents' religion? I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, it had never occurred to me. Um, does anybody else have personal... Um, <laughs> Um, I, I, I think sort of fear is, is probably more common. I mean, fear, fear of, of um, w what their parents are going to think r rather than anger, but, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, I'm, I'm interested in that. If, if, that's, if that question is based on personal experience, I'd be interested to hear more. Is, 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 is that a common experience? Yes. Yes. Wow. Ang anger on the part of the person who is undergoing the deconversion themselves? Yes. Anger against whom or what? The entire process. Having to bring the clergy people, all of the authority figures who pushed this as a norm, which was anathema to the child's reason. Right. 
Well, thank you. That's extremely interesting. I've learned something this evening. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ron. I'm Ron Feynman. I love physics. Um, two, two quick, two questions, if I may. Uh, at Liberty University, they have uh, on display some fossils that they say are. I might be off by a factor or by a thousand years or so, but they say these fossils of dinosaurs are 3,000 years old, maybe 4,000, maybe 5,000. My, my question, the first question to you is, what, what could they do to, to really prove to a scientist that those fossils are indeed um, that old only? Um, that's number one. And then number two, would you be willing to elucidate a little bit further your um, arguments against creation by design and maybe give us some better sense of cosmological time, just how long it really is? Right. Um, the, the belief that dinosaurs are only 3,000 years old and uh, that the, the universe is only 6,000 years old, how to give an idea of the real time span um, of the world. When what, one way to put it, which I've recently been think, thinking about, is that if somebody believes that the world is only 6,000 years old, or of the order of a few thousand years old, when the true age of the Earth is um, of the order of a few billion years old, that means they're out by a factor of a million. Um, which is not a trivial error. Uh, it's, I mean, I, I am not very good at, at, uh, at arithmetic, and I calculated that it's equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is 700 yards. Uh, but I received a letter from a, a, a mathematician who'd done, his, done the sum again, and he said I got it wrong it's actually equivalent to believing that the distance from New York to San Francisco is 28 feet. <laughs> um, either way, it gives you an idea of the scale of the error. Uh, the questioner asked what would uh, the um, people of Liberty University have to do in order to demonstrate that these d dinosaur fossils really were 3,000 years old. Well, what they would have to do is to find igneous rocks which uh, were found in proximity to or sandwiching the, the fossils and date these by radioactive dating several different, half a dozen at least, different forms of radioactive dating all of which give independent estimates of the date of these fossils and all those different methods of doing it should point to an age of 3,000 years. In fact, of course, what they, those uh, methods of dating all show is that dinosaur fossils are hundreds of millions, well, no less than 65 million years old. Not just one method of radioactive dating, lots and lots of different methods of radioactive dating, different clocks, clocks working on completely different principles that, that all point to the same order of magnitude of age of these dinosaur fossils. If it's really true that the museum at Liberty University has uh, dinosaur fossils which are labelled as being 3,000 years old, then that is an educational disgrace. <laughs> it is debauching the whole idea of a university and I would strongly encourage any members of Liberty University who may be here to leave and go to a proper university. With your elucidating on um, chance versus uh, natural selection versus uh, intelligent design and give us a sense of right. cosmological time. 
um, chance and natural selection and intelligent design. One of the biggest fallacies in popular understanding of Darwinian evolution by natural selection is that it is a theory of random chance. It is not. It's the, it's the very opposite, and this is one of the most important things to understand about it. Um, uh, there is a, a certain chance element in it. The mutation is a, is a process of random chance. It's random with respect to improvement. Things don't tend to get better as a result of mutation. The important step in the Darwinian theory of evolution is natural selection. Natural selection is a non-random process. Natural selection is the non-random survival of randomly varying genetic codes. And the reason why some genetic codes survive better than others is their phenotypic effects via the processes of embryogenesis on phenotypes, on bodies, uh, which make them survive or not survive, reproduce or not survive. And the ones that do survive and reproduce pass on the genetic coded instructions that built them and equipped them and made them good at surviving and reproducing. That's the idea. Um, that is the explanation for the apparent adaptive design, the, 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 the illusion of design which all living things show. It is a non-random process. It does not involve design of any sort. Um, it produces an illusion of design. It is hard for people to grasp for various reasons, and one reason the questioner has pinpointed is the sheer length of time involved. Geological time is larger than most human minds are capable of grasping. Um, one of the various metaphors have been used to um, convey the sheer magnitude of geological time. One that I like, which I didn't invent, is you hold out your hand to represent the um, the, the length of geological time, and if, say, the middle of my tie is the origin of life and the tip of my finger is the present, then the dinosaurs, which went extinct 65 million years ago, um, lived about there. Most of this is bacteria. You have, um, you have um, multicellular life evolving about here, dinosaurs about there, humans at my fingernail, and the whole of recorded human history Everything from the Egyptians, biblical times, the Romans, the Assyrians, the Greeks, all of human history disappears in the dust from one stroke of a nail file. That's the, the scale of human history, is, is the dust from one stroke of a nail file on the same scale as the time that's available, that has been available for evolution. That is one of the reasons why people find it so hard to understand. There are many reasons. I've written about eight books on the subject um, which um, preceded the God Delusion, and it, it's a little hard to condense it into a few minutes. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know when we're supposed to stop, and I... We want to, Professor Dawkins is going to sign books for us after this down in Ribble Lounge, which is downstairs, to give him a few minutes to get there. But I think we probably better stop here, here for this evening. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.